This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So uh, this week we're reading a double parsha, two parshiot, and it's Tazria Mitzora. I'm going to give a little overview to that, but I want to focus on a later parsha as it relates to the counting of the Omer, which is what we are doing right now. So we'll, we'll come to all that in a moment. Just Tazria Mitzora deals with a very, very fascinating phenomenon. And it deals with uh, what, what we misdefine as leprosy. Okay, because the leprosy that the Torah is speaking about is not the leprosy that we know of in the world today, but rather this was a spiritual, uh, excuse me, a physical manifestation of a spiritual malaise, a spiritual deterioration. And that spiritual deterioration according to the sages, came comes from Tsar Ayin, this, oh, why do they have this? Why does, they have, why does he have that? Why does she have that? I want that. They shouldn't have that. And most prominently, from Lashon Hara, from speaking in a negative, derogatory manner about someone else. And, and we go through in painstaking detail, all the different types of tzara'at, what is considered to be tzara'at, which again is the Hebrew term. I don't want to use leprosy because it's not leprosy. I'm just going to use the term tzara'at. What is tzara'at, what's not tzara'at, and then the Kohen needs to come and ascertain what it is, or if it, if it is, if it isn't, and then there's a whole purification process that one goes through and during the time of tzarat the person is sent he sent outside the encampment almost like saying you know with a kid you give them a time out right if you don't know how to play nicely then you can't play with the other children you have to be by yourself you have to, if you're not playing nicely you can't play with the children well that's what happens to the to, to the mitzorah with tzarat you don't know how to interact properly. You're going to be bad mouthing people and gossiping and and finding fault and broadcasting that. Then you can't talk to people. You need to have a time out. And the person is sent michutz lamachaneh outside of the camp. Two ideas that I wanted to bring out, though, and then we'll jump to what I wanted to get to. Idea number one. You know, we have the proverbial um, lightning bolt, right? Well, there's no lightning bolt, right? You know, if you do something wrong, you're not going to get struck by lightning, are you? Right? And, and that's true, right? The way that God runs the world is we have our free will. And if we're doing things that are wrong, God get, has patience and gives us time to to turn ourselves around to get out of the mess that we've got ourselves into and there is no you know, the person is not struck by lightning if we would be struck by lightning whenever we would do something wrong we would never do anything wrong and that would that would really defeat the purpose of mankind as we understand it which is a being who has free will and therefore owns, creates the decisions that we make and are transformed by the decisions that we make. But if we are coerced into it, then there is no real growth, no real development. Right? As, as we discussed earlier by Pharaoh and the plagues that came onto Mitzrayim, onto Egypt, so God was not hardening his heart. God was strengthening his heart, taking away the fear of the next plague. So Pharaoh's free will decision actually was, do I want to listen to God or not? And that's why we are not struck with lightning. We don't have plagues. 
and therefore we are deciding not do I want to get hit by by lightning again? Do I want to get hit by lightning like my friend did? But we're deciding do I want to connect to this creator, master of the universe, or do I want to try to go my own way and and, and not connect to him? So there is no lightning bolt. People do not get struck by lightning, with one exception. There's one exception, and that is this parsha. When it comes to lashon hara or the other causes of tsarat, there is this lightning bolt, and it would first actually affect a person's house. The walls are turning colors. They're turning green. They're turning red. The walls are turning colors. This is not your usual, probably you don't have usual mold, but this is not typical mold over here. This is a strange phenomenon. And if a person heeds the lesson, very good. One goes through the process of purifying the house and life goes on. If one does not heed the process, then it afflicts one's garments, right? And this is not me doing laundry and everything coming out crazy colors, right? This is only white garments that are turning these colors. And if one heeds the lesson, then one goes through the process of purifying that which became impure and life goes on in the, on the right path. If one doesn't heed that warning, then lightning keeps striking closer and closer. First the house, then the garments, and then the person, which in and of itself is a very, very powerful idea that we have all of these garments, all of these exteriors. Our house is one level of exterior. Getting closer to home, our garments is another level of exterior. And getting even closer to home, our skin, our physical self is also a garment, is also an exterior. So the message keeps getting closer and closer to home to realize there is decay here. There is erosion, erosion of values, erosion of priorities, erosion of importance. And one has got to work on cleansing, purifying, uplifting, changing, transforming. So point number one is that even though there is, a person does not get struck by lightning if they do something wrong, when it comes to this, this is the one exception. Uh, if a person breaks the Sabbath, we don't say the house starts to turn colors or then this or then that. Or a person is eating non kosher, we don't say this starts to turn colors and then that and then this. But when it comes to our words, that is when we have this lightning bolt. We have this cause and effect, this clear indication from the heavens. So let me ask you why? Why would it be when it comes to Lashon Hara speaking badly? Why specifically over there do we have the lightning bolt? We have 613 commandments and one gets a lightning bolt. Why? Why does this one get the lightning bolt, my friends? Um, because when we speak Lashon Hara, uh, we can destroy others or we can destroy reputations. Um, we're just speaking evil about somebody else, even if it's okay. true. Okay, so Rose is making a very a, a very potent point over here. All right. How can I harm someone who's on the other side of the world? I don't have any any ballistic missiles in my uh, in my house. How can I harm someone over there? All right. The potential of harm that Lashon Hara has is incredible. It's incredible just how far, how far it can reach. Nice, nice. The damage, right? 
physically, what can I reach? My words, oh boy. And, and nowadays, <laughs> nowadays, with one errant hit stroke of the computer, right? You post it on Twitter or you send it to Facebook, it can't come back. You can erase it, but it's there. Screenshots, it's there. It doesn't come back. Words have the ability to, to affect incredibly, incredibly far and, um, and powerfully. Yeah, good. Anyone else? Rabbi, was it um? Does it have anything to do with um? You know, maybe back in those times, um, our, our words were a little bit more powerful. I mean, spoken in the land of Israel, um, because that prophecy only existed there. Um, could that could, could that have been something? Because now, um, you know, it's not really the same. Okay. Okay. So, um. I would say it is the same now, but I think with that, you're touching on an important point, right? And that is our words, if we are speaking Lashon Hara, we are taking a gift that was given to us with tremendous potential. I can speak to God in prayer. I can say words of Torah as we are saying now. I can speak words of kindness. So I was given this tool, which has such potential, and I'm then grabbing it and using it for something that is harmful. One second. All right, so that, that is, we think alike, Mark, right? So that is, uh, yeah. So, so that's another point, that this was something that was given to us for Kedusha, for holiness, for with tremendous potential. And we are misappropriating it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, Aura. <clears throat> I think the world was created by the word. Mm. Nice. The, po the power of the word so yeah. as as it can be creative it can also be destructive beautiful 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 right it says and god said let there be light uh, who did god say it to <laughs> who's he saying it to right but it means god willed there to be light and there was light yet it is couched it is presented as god said to, to, to point out exactly what Ora just shared with us, that words have the ability to, to, to create, to build, and to destroy. Good. One other point that occurred to me, that uh, Tsara'at and Tsarut Ain. Tsarut Ain is uh, jealousy. Yeah. It Sounds it has the, the letters of Tsaraat. Yeah, Tsarik Resh, Tsar, yeah, nice. Nice, a no. similar show resh. Tsarat has an ayin. It has a... does not, but nevertheless, but it's no. the same, it's the same start. But the expression is Tsarut Ayn. Tsarut Ayn is kin a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it... interesting. Rav Hirsch, Rav Hirsch, Rav Hirsch, Rav Hirsch says that in Hebrew. If you have the first two letters of a shoresh, right, are often, you have para, which means to multiply. You have parach, which means to sprout, right? You have all these different um, peireshes, right, which will all uh, be similar. And here, they all starting with tzadik resh, which means narrow. Right? Tsar is narrow and it's narrow in the way that I speak. It's right. Yes, very nice. One other thought that I had is that it's so easy. And, th and that's why it's so dangerous. Speech is so easy. Sometimes it's too easy. Right? If we had to really go through the motions of sounding it out and saying it, we'd be a lot more judicious 
in that which we say, but because it's so easy, it just flies out of it. It just flies out of our mouth. I, I can't believe I said that, right? Because it just, it's so easy. And that's what adds to the danger. And that's why we need to have this, this lightning bolt uh, reaction. Good. Just one other idea. I'm, I'm reading a very fascinating book. And um, it made a very interesting point how, how Judaism really introduced this concept of what we have in the American govern, govern, governance, government system of checks and balances. We have the king, and he has his powers, but there's also the prophets and the, the kohanim that restrict what the, what, the, what the king can do. You have the, the kohanim. Right now, in the in the um, idolatrous world, the priests were the most powerful, right? Because they controlled the gods. <laughs> they were the goat between with the gods. So therefore, you had to really pay tremendous tribute to the right. They were incredibly powerful and uh, and wealthy. So in the Torah, we have the Kohanim. But they don't own land. They don't get, they did not get a portion in the land. And therefore they're spread out amongst all the tribes. And the tribe, each tribe had to designate certain cities as Ari Levian, cities for the tribe of Levi. So that's one way that that the Torah made sure that their power and their role would not would not go out of control. Then a, 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 a thought, I actually saw someone speaks about this also, right? And the Kohanim, right? So they're there doing the sacrifices very lofty, but they're also the ones who have to go and examine all of these ailments, all of this saras to determine what it is, right? It's not the most, you know, I would imagine a doctor who works with infectious skin diseases, right, is spending all day checking that out. It's not the most honored thing. Right? You're dealing with people who are in pain, physical pain, emotional pain, right? You're dealing with something that we would often find repulsive, right? When we see someone who's got some sort of a skin ailment, it's, it, it's not so pleasant to look at. So we see the Torah is really structured to keep everyone in balance, right? Oh, I'm the Kohen. All right, you've got to go to this and this address and start checking out. There's, there's this person there with this horrific skin condition, and we're afraid it might be Tsaras. All right, I'll go. Uh, it's somewhat deflating, and it, it helps. The, the Torah has this has these checks and balances to keep everyone grounded. To keep everyone grounded, they realize, "Hey, I'm here as a servant of God in God's world, and let me not get uh, too too pompous and too too full of myself." and these are my responsibilities. Okay, so that's Tazria and Mitzorah. Just two points I wanted to make on that. I do want to jump up to page 682, okay? I like to discuss, right now we are in the midst of Sfirat HaOmer, which is the counting of the Omer. We're actually counting from the Omer. What is this Omer? And we'll soon see, very, very interesting from David Foreman, where else this word appears. And it will help give us a glimpse of what we're supposed to be focusing on during these days. So the Omer was a barley meal offering that was brought in the temple on the second day of Pesach. And now we're counting from the day that that was brought 
until the time that we're going to bring a new meal offering, a wheat chametz leavened, two loaves of bread offering. And that's going to be brought on Shavuot. So we're counting from the meal barley offering on the day after Pesach. We're counting until the two loaves of wheat, beautiful challah, chametz offering that's brought on Shavuot. And it's meant to be this transition from barley, which at least then was considered to be animal food, to beautiful wheat loaves. And that's the transition that we're making from a lowly slave nation that left Egypt, whom in the course of 49 days will be standing by Mount Sinai for the revelation, the only claimed national revelation in the history of mankind. Realize that. Every religion has its revelation story, but the revelation story is always to an individual or to a small group. And believe it or don't believe it, it's up to you. But Judaism is the only religion to make the preposterous claim, preposterous if it were not true, because how could I convince you what you saw? The claim that there was this revelation to an entire nation, not to one individual. And that can't just be inserted into history. Uh, when did that happen? How come we haven't heard about that? So we're making the transformation of these 49 days and every day we count as we go from the lowly slave nation to the sacrifice that represents this nation of, of fully developed, spiritually developed human beings who are ready to stand by Mount Sinai. But essentially, it is a sacrifice. Now, in Vayikra, in Leviticus, where we are now, the Torah discusses sacrifices, and the Torah, the barley was not chametz, Janet. Right? Barley, wheat is also not chametz. Our Janet asked at the second day of Pesach, how do we have barley? Isn't that chametz? Right? Barley is not chametz. Wheat is not chametz. Our matzah is made from wheat. So we're eating wheat. Right? You can have oat matzah. You can have all these different, right? It depends how it is made. And this was not in a chametz form. This was in a matzah form. But good point, Janet. Thanks for bringing that up. So we have the portions that deal with sacrifices. And over here on page 682 in Parshat Emor Perichav Gimel, we have Parshiot that are dealing with the holidays, right? Uh, chapter, chapter 23, page 682, 683, right? These are the holy, these are the Moadei Hashem, the holy convocations. And we first talk about Shabbat, good. And then we talk about, starting on, on verse 4, we speak about Pesach. Wonderful. Now, if we'll jump up ahead, right, then on 685, we talk about Shavuot. On 687, we speak about Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret. That's all the holidays. Yet on 684, we interject, starting on verse 16, 15 and 16. Sorry, Johnny, you need to mute if you can, please. Oh, sorry. No problem. So now we start talking about Svira, counting the Omer. Now, granted, that takes us from Pesach to Shavuot, but it's offerings. What is that doing over here? So le let's take a look over here at these sukim. Um, 
Let's go to page 682, verse 9 and 10. Speak to the children of Israel, say to them, when you come to the land that I'm giving to you, you will reap the harvest. You'll bring the Omer, Reshit Ketzirchem. In Omer, which is a certain measurement of the first of your harvest to the Kohen. And he will wave that Omer before God. Mimacharat HaShabbat, the day after Shabbat. Now, actually, we'll, we're going to focus on this. But after Shabbat actually means, and this was a big debate between the Tzadukim and the Rabbanon, that they took it literally after Shabbat. It's got to be on a Sunday. After Shabbat is Sunday, right? But, but, but the sages prove that no... After Shabbat over here, Shabbat over here is a reference to Pesach. So therefore, it's the day after Pesach. Vasitem, and you will do on the day that you weigh this Omer, you bring the sacrifices, right, etc. Pasuk Yudalid, the Lechem, the Kali, the Carmel, but any uh, uh, bread, kernels, plum kernels. You cannot eat until this day. What did this offering accomplish? There's something called the Yashan and Chadash. When it comes to grain, there's last year's grain and there's this year's grain. The Omer allows you to eat the grain that grew during this past year, that now allows you to have to eat this. That's what ushers in, allows you to eat the chadash, the new grain. Until then, you're not, you're eating from the previous harvest. This is what allows you to eat from the new grain. And then, as we said before, verse 16, you'll start counting from the day you bring this, you're counting your seven weeks, 49 days. And then what do you do? And then Finally, what will you do? Verse 17, you're going to bring lechem tenufa shtayin. You're going to bring two loaves of bread. Okay. And then again, another thing that's strange over here is before we get back to the holidays, look on page 686. Verse 22. And when you're harvesting the harvest of your land, lo do not complete the corner of your field. You can't harvest the whole field. You've got to leave that unharvested corner of the field, leave it like that for the poor. And they'll come and they'll take what's called the peya, the corner of the field. Furthermore, v'leket kitzircha lo and also, the gleanings of your harvest, don't take that. Meaning, as I'm harvesting, I'm going around with my machete, I'm harvesting. If there are a few that are left standing, don't go back to that. Leave that for the poor. La'ani, for the poor person. V'lager, for the convert. Ta'azovotam, leave them. Ani Hashem alokeicha. I am Hashem, your God. What is this doing over here? Even if you want to argue and say, yes, well, the Omer is there because it connects this holiday to that holiday, sort of. Because we're starting Mimacharat Shabbat, the day after Pesach, all the way to Shavuot. But what are these laws, these agricultural uh, um, um, benefact laws charity laws of our agriculture, what are they doing over here? So it seems to be a little bit strange. And what, what Rabbi David Foreman always likes to do is, well, where else do we have this? And let's see how it connects. So he says we have three factors over here. We're talking about the Omer. The Omer is a strange term. We don't find 
Omer all that much. Mimacharat HaShabbat, the day after Shabbat. And we have two loaves. So where else do we have this idea of Omer? The, the day after and Shabbat and two loaves. So let's take a look. Let's turn back to page 380. Are the, are the showbreads two loaves? Say it again. Are the showbreads two loaves? Twelve. Oh, okay. Well, let's go back to page 388. Someone has a different chumash than we do. We're in Shemot. Perek Tet Zion. Just one second. Let's go back to 386. Perek Ted Zion. Verse 15. Something strange came down from the heavens. And Israel saw it, and they said to, their, to, their, to one another, Manu, what is it? What is this? And Moses said, this is the bread that God has given you to eat. Zeadavar. This is what God has commanded. Lick to mimenu ish the fiachlo. Everyone should gather as much as they need to eat. No more, no less. How much? Omer. Oh, Omer. Here's the measure. In Omer, la gulgolet. La gulgolet means to a skull, to a head, to a person. Everyone take what they need. 17. So here we have Omer, right? B'nai Israel did it. And they gathered Hamar Be'ahamamit. They gathered some more and some less. And then they measured that Omer. And guess what? Whoever took more didn't gain any more. Whoever took less wasn't lacking. Hashem gave everybody what they needed. You try to take more, you're not going to have more. You didn't take enough, you'll have enough. Ish the fi achlo lakatu. Everyone will gather according to what they need to eat. And God and Moshe said, don't leave it over till the morning. Some people didn't leave it over. They left it over and it went rotten. And they gathered each and every morning. And then look at this. Bayoma Shishi, verse 22. Lik tu lechem mishnah. They gathered. And what did it turn into? Lechem mishnah. Does that sound familiar? That's a term we use for our two loaves of bread on Shabbat. To remind us of the bracha of the man. There was lechem mishnah. There was a double amount. Shneya Omer, two Omers, Le'echad, for each person. And they came to, to Moshe and they told Moshe. And he said, oh, it's Shabbat Lashem Machar. Tomorrow is Shabbat. Tomorrow is Shabbat. So we see we have these the same three factors over here. Here's our first mention of Omer. Omer is first mentioned when it came to the man, the support that we got from the heavens. And what are we told? Don't hog. Don't laket more than you're supposed to have. Don't gather more than you're supposed to have. Remember we asked, why are we talking about leket over there? Right by the Omer, what what does the agricultural uh, charity donation have to do with the Omer? Oh, well, the Omer is linked 
to the man. The Omer is linked to the man. It's the same amount. And what do we say? We also mention over there, the Shtei Lechem, the two loaves we have by Shavuot, they had a double portion over here. Why? Because it's Shabbat Machar. By us, we had Macharat HaShabbat, the day after Shabbat. Here we have it Shabbat Machar. So we're linking this Omer very, very strong. And we're told, don't take more than you need. Meaning, you'll have as much as you need. Don't take more. That's what links. You've got a whole field over here. You've got a whole field, a whole field over here. There are those who are hungry. Don't take more than you need. Leave that paya. Leave that corner of the field unharvested. Let them come and let them harvest. As you are leket, as you are gathering, don't, and some are left standing, don't go back for that. Leave it there. Don't take more than you need. The same way God gave you that man, God is giving you the produce over here. So all of a sudden we see, okay, and, and the same idea, don't eat from the new yet. There's a restriction, right? Once there's a restriction, I recognize, as we always say, we're discussing the Garden of Eden. I recognize I'm not the boss here. I'm here in God's world. And I worked and I planted and I did all this. Fair enough. But then there's a point where I have to recognize I did the work. I seem to have grown this, but it's coming from God. It's a gift from God. I, mean, I always say, right, if we'd seen food falling from the heavens, we'd say, oh, it's a miracle. And food growing from the ground is any less of a miracle? Oh, that's not a miracle. That's natural. They, you put in a seed. Oh, that explains it. You put in a seed where that weighs, you know, one hundredth of an ounce. And now this, and that's where this um, sequoia tree grew from. Oh, now I understand. That's not miraculous. That's that's natural. That that makes sense. That this little seed sprouted into into a redwood. Oh, that makes sense that half of a cell from a male and half of a cell from a female, these two zygotes fused together and out from that grew a human being. Out from that half and half cell comes a complete human being with a heart, liver, lungs, you name it. That makes perfect, oh, that's natural. So all of these are, th th this, this Omer, is bringing us back, bringing us back to the man, to the Omer Lugogola. When else do we have an Omer? Oh, that's a human portion for a day. That's how big the offering is that's brought to remind us of that first Omer in the Torah, the man, which was a human portion for a day. Don't take more. Plenty is going to fall. Don't take any more than you need. God will take care of you tomorrow also. Mm -hmm. Shabbos, you're not going to go out to gather. Double portion. The single portion you brought in is going to become a double portion. Right? And that's, as I said before, that's our Lecha Mishnah on Shabbos. Even though the, the double portion of Mom was on Friday, but it was because of Shabbos. Right? That's to show us that you do your work your six days, and that portion is going to grow. And you'll have seven days worth of parnasa, of sustenance, of livelihood from, from the six days that you that you worked. Yes, Ora. Uh, Rabbi, uh, I always thought that Omer is, um, is actually another word for wheat. But I just checked it. And Omer is really a measuring um, yep. unit. It's a measurement. Yeah. 
That's yeah. new to me. Yeah, and that's what we had. And that's what we had over there. That's what we just saw over here by the, by, um, by the man, right? It's an Omer Lugal That's the measurement. It's a daily ration of food, right? And that's the amount that we bring over here by Pesach. Let's go see now a third place. Now, keep in mind another point that, uh, that I left out. So the Omer reminds us of the man, right? The Omer offering reminds us of the man. When did the man start to fall? When did the man start to fall? Uh, when, um, I believe when the, um, when the Israelis left or the Jewish people left um, Mizraim, right? Yeah. We, needed we, to left eat. Egypt. we had some of our matzah that we took out with us. Once the matzah ran out, what happened? The man started to fall. So when did the man start to fall between Pesach and Shavuot? When do we bring our, our Omer offering? Right after Pesach, on the way towards Shavuot. Let's now go to page 1222. And this was the Haftorah that we read on Pesach. Okay? This is from the Navi, the prophet, from prophets. This is from Yehoshua, from Joshua. So we know that on, to on Shabbat and on Yom Tov, in addition to our Torah reading, we also read a selection from the Navi, from the prophets. Right? Why do we do that? There was a time during the period leading up to Hanukkah where there was decrees against our reading from the Torah, but we were allowed to read from prophets. So therefore, since we couldn't read from the Torah during our Shabbat morning services, we didn't want to completely lose that. So we instead read something that was thematically connected, a portion from the prophets that was thematically connected to the Torah reading. So it's a very, very small sampling of the prophet readings that are read on the Shabbat afternoons. It was right, we choose those, those which are thematically linked to the Torah reading. Kathy, I'm sure you have heard uh, people say, oh, well, you know, uh, the Jews don't read those portions of the Navi because we're trying to hide it. We're not trying to hide anything. It's a very small sampling of Navi, Parshio, of parts of the prophets that are read. It's only those that thematically connect. So here we're talking about the time of Yahushua. And we've entered the land of Israel, page 1222. And the children that had been born in the desert, the conditions did not allow for safe circumcision. But now we've entered the land and now we need to have circumcision. So therefore, that the Nehem, he came tachtam, verse 7 on page 1222. This is from Joshua chapter 5, verse 7. And the children that grew there in the place of those who had died in the Midbar, in the desert, they had not been circumcised. O Tom Mal Yehoshua. Yehoshua circumcised them. Ki Arelim Hayu. Because they were uncircumcised. They were not able to be circumcised as they were traveling. And it was that then after the circumcision, verse 9, and Hashem said to Yeshua, Hayom Galoti, today I have removed, peeled off, Cherpat Mitzrayim, the disgrace of Egypt that's upon you. And he called the name of the place Gilgal Ad Hayom Hazeh. He called it Gilgal until this day because Gal, God had rolled off the, the, the scourge, the, the disgrace of Egypt. 
Vayachanu b'nei Yisrael bad Gilgal. And they encamped in Gilgal. Vayasu etah Pesach. And what did they do? They made the Pesach. They brought the, the, the Pesach offering on the 14th day of that month. In Arvot Yericho, in Jericho there. Vayochlu me'avor ha'aretz mimacharat ha'pesach. And then what do they do? They ate on the day after Pesach, matzot v'kaluy v'etzem ayom mazeh. They ate the matzot and the kaluy, the roasted grain, v'etzem ayom mazeh, on that very day. Hold the place here and just look back to where we started on 686 or 680. Six eighty four. What do we say over there in verse fourteen? Lech and the kali the carmel bread kernels plum kernels lo tochlu don't eat ad etzema until the midst of this day. So what do they do over here? Back to twelve twenty two. What do they do in Yoshua? This is the bookend. This is the end of the man. We've now entered the land of Israel. And what happened? Right? They ate. In the middle of this day, they ate from the new grain. Verse 12. Vayishbot haman mi macharat. The man then stopped falling on that day after. Yisrael man. And there was no longer any man for the children of Israel. And instead, what do they do? They ate from the produce of the land of Canaan that year. So the Omer is linked to the man falling. It's to remind us of the man falling. And then it continues. And in Yoshua, we speak about once the man stopped falling, what did they do? They brought this Omer, which allows them from the Etzem Hayom Hazer, from the middle of that day, it allows them to continue to eat the new produce. And every year we are reminded of this. Every year with the Omer, Allowing us to eat from the new produce, what is that meant to remind us? That even at the point where the man has stopped, as we saw in Yahushua, we're meant to remember the man that when it first began to fall. Why is that? What would you say, my friends? Why is it that we are meant to remember the man Every year at this time, when the man fell and the man stopped, we have to remember the man. Because we have to remember where we came from and what we had then and what we have now. Okay, good. On one, on, on one idea, remember where we came from and what we have now. Good. Anything else to add? That he's the ultimate sustainer. Okay, good, Daryl. Right? And it was not just to remember what we had, okay. then, but to recognize and realize that what we have now is just another manifestation. It's another way of God giving it to us. What we have now is just another manifestation of what we had then. Then the food came from the heavens. Thank you, God. Now the food comes from the ground. Thank you, God. Yes. Um, also, because we have to remember the miracle <clears throat> that when we don't have food and God provides us, um, he makes miracles for us. If we don't have food, then he shows us in a miraculous way how we can still get it even um, even though we, we don't work for that, but God is helping us get that no matter what. Yes, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. 
So we no longer have the man falling, but we do have the man falling. We do have the man falling. Again, it's no less miraculous that food falls from the heaven than food grows from the, from, from the dirt, from the earth. So therefore, the Omer is there to, to, during this time. It brings us back to the man. It brings us forward to Yahushua. And it reminds us, A, what we had then. B, that what we have now is just another manifestation of God's granting us this gift of what we need, right? Our birkat mazon, our grace after meals. Berkat Hashem, hazan et olam kulo v'tuvo. You sustain the world with your goodness. And we recognize that. And once again, as we remember the man, we also remember the peya and the leket. Meaning, if it's God who's sustaining the world, well, he wants all of his children to have sustenance. And sometimes we have the gift that we are able to be the vehicle through which God will be sharing his bounty with other people. As we saw by the man, you took too much, you're not going to have any more than you need. And we see by the Omer, right after the Omer, we're talking holidays. We're to, right? Why are we talking about Peya leaving the corner of the field? Why are we looking, talking about Leket over here? Because if we recognize it's a gift from God, then we have to make sure that we don't take more than we're supposed to be taking. And if God gave me this, this field, he didn't give me 100% of the field. He gave me 95% of the field. And 5%, he made me the custodian. It's a custodial account that I've got that for the poor. And when he gave me all that I harvested, all that I, all that I reaped, anything that remained standing, he didn't give me. That's for the poor. And then when I make my bundles, and I bring it from the field. That's called shikha. If I forget a bundle, I can't go back to get it. I have to leave that to the poor. And when I take all of my produce and I bring it to the, to the granary area and I have it in a big pile, at that point, I take off 2% and give to the Kohanim. And 10% and I give to the Levi. And another 10%, depending on the year, either it goes to the poor or it goes to be in Yerushalayim where I shared with poor people over there. It is reminder after reminder after reminder after reminder, because when the man falls from heaven, it's easy to understand this is a gift from God, thank you. But when I sweat and I work and it grows from the ground, I can have this fallacy, this misconception that this is mine. I worked for this. I bought the seeds. I planted the seeds. I fertilized the earth. I watered the seeds. Yeah, then make your own seed. Try that one. So we have all of these reminders that this is man from the ground. This is a gift from God. And don't usurp. Don't grab more than you're supposed to be having. Recognize it's a gift from God and share the wealth, share the gift as you are supposed to share it. So the man then is letting us know the, the Omer, as we're counting the Omer, as we're remembering the Omer, let's keep in mind the very powerful lesson of this Omer, of man to today that we are eating different manifestations of man every time we put food into our mouths. And therefore we have to have this constant appreciation and certainly a way that we uh, help, that we express that appreciation and help ourselves focus to have that appreciation is the brachot that we make. Besides all the tzedakah, it's the brachot, the blessings that we make before we eat, the blessings that we make after we eat. It's all our way of showing that we're not taking the gifts 
that surround us constantly. We say in our Amidah, Erev, Avok, Erev, Tzarayim, evening, morning, afternoon, the Nisecha, the miracles, Shevichol Yom Imana, that are with us every day, V'tovatecha, V'rachamecha, your good, your compassion, that we are cognizant, we are aware. So the Omer brings us back to the man falling, brings us forward to the man ending, and gives us the perspective for us who live in the post-man world. But it's not any less miraculous than the man world was. Okay, my friends, we'll call it over here. So we jumped a little bit away from our parshiot, but uh, went into what we're doing right now with our uh, Sfirat HaOmer, with the counting of the Omer, and what is supposed to help us remember and stay focused on. Thank you, Rabbi. You're very welcome. Thank you. Beautiful. Good, night. good week. Shavua Tov. A good Chodesh. Today's Rosh Chodesh, starting the month of ER. So a good month to everybody. And uh, you all have good things. Toda Chodesh Tov. Chodesh Tov. Shalom, shalom. Thank you. Chodesh Tov. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome.